Greetings. It is week 20, and believe it or not, it is time to start thinking garden moms. I'm Bill Calkins, and I'm really pleased to be joined today by two mom experts, Dr. Will Healy, who's the Senior Manager of Ball Technical Services, and Cindy Drumgool, the Product and Business Manager of Ball Moms. As the Senior Manager of Technical Services, Dr. Will is responsible for developing production programs and operational efficiencies that produce consistent crops across all classes, including, but not limited, to garden moms. He works with the ball companies and customers throughout the world on production and cutting edge strategies. His mom experience goes all the way back to his days at University of Minnesota, where he earned his PhD, working with Dr. Harold Wilkins on a lot of mom production innovations. He's also a frequent guest on Ball Seed STEM podcast, and he and I produced a three-part mini-series a little while back on garden mum production. We'll talk about that in a bit, and the links can be found in the notes for this video. Cindy currently manages the Ball Mums program and recently joined the team after more than two decades as head grower and general manager of Five Acre Farm Growers in Massachusetts. She grew hundreds and thousands of garden mums and fall crops for garden centers in New England. And at Five Acres, she also managed the Garden Mum Root and Cell Division, producing liners for Syngenta and Getty Flora. Bottom line, Cindy knows mums inside and out. So between these two experts, there's more than 50 years of Garden Mum experience. So it's safe to say you should listen closely as they kick off this season by sharing tips and tricks and resources and some new research to help you produce the best Garden Mum crop you've ever grown. So let's get into it. Welcome, Cindy and Will. As mum liners start to ship and greenhouses start receiving the boxes and trays, do you have any wise words for growers as they start unpacking and putting the garden mums on the bench? Well, you know, one of the things that I always want growers to be thinking about is, okay, it's been a crazy, crazy spring, um, like most springs are. Um, and it's now that time of year where we need to start kind of putting spring behind us and start thinking forward to where we're going to go with mums. So, you know, what I want to make sure that we do today is kind of hit on a couple of high points, give, make sure people get pointers of where to go um, for additional information so they can get everyone's back, their heads back into the mum world, because getting off to a good start means success come June, July, and August. Awesome. I think you're absolutely right. Now's the time when you've really got to kind of shift your thinking. It's probably tough because spring is in full tilt, yep. but if you don't get these mums started right, you're going to be in trouble throughout the entire season. Cindy, any uh, tips as a, as a grower who totally understands how, how nutso this time of year can be, but how you need to uh, shift focus on garden mums? Well, just a, a quick a uh, little tip is when the, the liners come in and you've got them sitting on the bench waiting to be planted, don't forget to continue to feed them. Um, especially with mums needing so much feed, you really want to make sure your liners aren't starving when you plant them and, and get ready to go out to the field. That's cool. And we're going to talk a lot about nutrition uh, here coming up. But we definitely wanted to start by uh, sharing some uh, resources and uh, uh, that are available from Ball Mums, and uh, and and about some of the ways that we can uh, we can get some of the best information in the hands of our growers to kick off the season. So definitely want to start with one of the best mum resources, which is the BallSeed.com/slash/GardenMums page. And on this page, you can find everything from the catalogs, the brochures got special catalogs just for mums that are perfect for the landscape. There's an A to Z quick reference guide that is uh, reflective of what's shown in the catalog. And uh, a new feature that, that was uh, uploaded last year is this garden mum growth tracking tool, which is extremely handy for growers. Will's going to tell us a little bit more about that here in a bit, but just wanted you to be aware that, we, that there is this fantastic page at ballseed.com. Go to ballseed.com slash garden mums. Real easy to remember and uh, you're gonna find loads and loads of information. Uh, we spoke a little bit about the Garden Mums catalog. I think that historically, the Garden Mums catalog has really been considered as much of a tool as it is a catalog by uh, Garden Mum growers. And I was just gonna let Cindy talk a little bit about what's, uh, what's available in the catalog since you and the team worked so hard on it. So thanks, Bill. Yeah, the catalog we spent a lot of time on, um, we did, updates and 
just tried to get a lot of information out there. So when you're planting your crop, it's available. We have bloom shots and habit shots of all the varieties and all the cultural information with everything arranged uh, by color initially in the catalog. Um, and then we also have a lot of technical information, you know, like the one showing on the screen, propagation of garden mums, um, all the way through to finishing your crop, uh, natural season, whether it's a, a black cloth shaded program, lots of great tips. And then new uh, was this A to Z quick reference. I wanted to have something so when you're sitting down and planning, you don't have to keep flipping through all the pages. Everything you need to know is, is right there in front of you and you can see which crops or which varieties are good and which size pots and for shade or not for shade and all that kind of uh, great information. So we think it's a great tool and really, really want you to use it. It's definitely packed and packed with information. I know that growers uh, of Garden Mums wait for this catalog to come every other year. Uh, and on the off year is a supplement with a lot of excellent information too. So uh, definitely pull out your, your ball seed Garden Mums catalog and you're going to find a lot of great information to hand to your growers. Uh, if you don't happen to have a catalog, like I said before, jump, in, jump on ballseed.com slash garden mums for a digital copy or contact your sales rep or color link rep or ball customer service and they'll get a catalog out to you right away. And Will, uh, you know, like I mentioned, we put together this uh, mini series on the STEM podcast a little while ago and we really never imagined the response. It got more than a thousand downloads and they still continue to come in. I, I imagine that more and more growers are going to download it again this year. We covered starting the crops, tracking and measuring to hit the key retail dates, tons of production tips, and then uh, how to finish strong and send them out the door at, at, their, at their peaks. So what can you share about this mini series to kind of encourage the listeners and viewers of this video to click on the links and, and uh, jump on the podcasts? Well, one of the things that I really liked about these podcasts <clears throat> is like we had said earlier about getting your head back in the game is that the beauty of a podcast is you can basically download it and then walk about as you're um, you know, working at this time of the year, doing some of those um, tasks that don't need a lot of um, brain power, but you can sit and at least listen and get some ideas because, you know, you might have grown mums for 25 years, which means that you've done this 25 times differently. And, you know, one, part of the um, idea behind the podcast is giving you a whole group of different ideas, different strategies, um, you know, starting out with, you know, right now, starting your crop, making sure that um, you've got all of the little, little things done correctly. You know, as one grower um, always told me is, is, you know, you could be a, um, do you want to be a A plus grower? Because growing is like going to school. You really want to make sure that you've got 90 plus percent of the points. And how you get that is you do 90% of the tasks, 90% of the time on time, um, and 90% all the time. So you really have to sit down and kind of review what are all those little details, and that's really what um, each of these um, different podcasts do. Part one, we really talk about how do you get off to a good start? What should you be doing now um, to make sure that you don't have to be fixing problems all the way through the season? A little bit later, once you've got it up and growing, is the question that always asks um, is, am I on track? Am I doing it right? Am I ahead of the crop? Am I behind? How can I actually tell whether I'm going to hit the dates that are critical? Because, you know, every year it's a little different. You know, this year we're starting out um, rather cold. Last year we were rather warm initially. So you've got to really adjust your protocols and your practices so that you are on track and you stay on track. And then, of course, having a great looking mums that fall apart at the end are always, it's always a disappointment. So we really want to be looking at how do you finish strong and get them to retail. So they break it into those three parts because they're really those are the three seasons of a mum crop. And we have to re remind ourselves every year of what are the small details that I need to remember. And even if you pick up one idea, it was time well spent listening to an hour to remind yourself and to refresh yourself and give you some different insight in how you can do it better. So, you know, definitely pick up the podcast and, and have a listen and see, hear what you can do to have a great crop this year. 
Excellent. You can also find those on the uh, ballseed.com slash garden mums page. Believe it or not, everything you need <laughs> is right there. So I think that uh, that that helps. We've shared a lot of the resources that are available. So let's let's finish up this uh, short uh, <laughs> recording today with some key technical tips to help growers kick off the season. Will, I'm going to let you take the reins here. And I, I don't want to sound negative, but do you want to start with some of the problems to be aware of and any specific diseases or pests to think about when you're uh, getting your mums off to a strong start? And, uh, and then obviously it's continuing it throughout the season. Oh, yeah. You know, when I take a look at the mum crops um, and how, are, how to be successful is really if you don't monitor this crop, well, you kind of end up on vacation. And that's probably a biggest problem that we have is, you know, this is during the height of the vacation. Everyone's kind of burnt out from a hectic spring and they really don't pay attention. So make sure that you've got a monitoring program in, in place that basically lets you know what's happening and where um, different problems are starting to occur so you can react to them. You know, remember, we are a very visual industry. You know, writing things down, keeping tables, keeping charts um, of just raw data really doesn't work. We need to see it to believe it. So make sure that you go and graph and That's why we created the um, graphing tool that you can see on the um, MUM um, resource page that basically allows you to graph your MUM crop so that you're sure that you're getting it up to size. There's a lot of things you can do to either slow it down, keep it shorter, or make it bigger, but you gotta do it early. You can't wait till they're in bloom and go, I'm three inches short. Well, there's not a lot you can do at that point. Another thing that you can look at is, is monitoring your EC and pH. Many years ago, we had a total crop management project where we said, you know, if we monitor the insects, monitor the disease in the mum crop, but oh, by the way, let's monitor the EC and pH and let's see um, what is important. And what we found was the EC and pH monitoring was the most important in making sure that you had a quality crop because invariably, you might have insects and disease, but they always occurred after the EC went off track, too low, too high, plants became stressed, insects became a problem, diseases started moving in, and suddenly you had a real problem. But if you would have been noticing that three weeks before the EC was zero, the plants weren't, you know, they're still green, but there was no nutrition available. So eventually two, three weeks later, the plants are stressed and suddenly you've got a whole host of problems pH starting to wander out of control, um, and suddenly you got plants that are yellow and you're wondering how, how could all they get turned yellow? Well, two weeks ago, the pH suddenly started wandering 6.5, 6.8, 7, 7.2. You could have caught that much earlier and started changing it. So let's really think about monitoring the crop and graphing it to see it. Um, you know, the other thing is, is you, don't, you need to have a playbook. What is your preventative program? What are you going to be doing this year? You know, kind of sketch out what were my problems last year because those are a good probability that I'm going to see them again this year. What's my plan? What's my chemicals? Do I have them on order? Do my suppliers have these chemicals or do I need a different strategy because those chemicals aren't available? You know, anticipate what, are, what could be my problems? You know, spend a half hour writing down all the problems that you remember, because if you remember them, they were a problem. So anticipate, don't react, get ahead of them. Big problems, we want everyone to be thinking about chrysanthemum white rust, especially up in the Northeast and a couple of other parts of um, the US and Canada. Chrysanthemum white rust in the United States is a quarantinable disease. This is where the guys in the white suits come in and visit you and take your mums away not a good plan because it happens at flowering. So make sure that you've got a chrysanthemum white rust spray program in place to make sure that you don't have any problems. Periodically, we run into problems with growers who have Western flower thrips and TOSPO viruses, INSCV, TSWV. Now is the time to be saying, have, do we have a thrips problem in our bedding plants? If you have a thrips problem or thrips present in your bedding plants today in May, well, guess what? The pupa, that, that important life cycle of the thrips, are going to be falling into the ground here shortly, and they're going to build up in the ground. Then nothing's going to happen, and you're going to put mums in there. Well, guess what? They're going to come up out of the ground, and they're, they've got the virus, they've got TOSPO virus in them, and they're going to transmit it to your mums. Again, in some states, 
that is a quarantinable non-sale disease. So make sure that you get out there with some PACE 49, um, strip it to um, basically treat the fields, and then basically that will break the cycle so you can break the soil-borne cycle of the Western flower thrips. Critical for success. Of course, those of you who have been um, unfortunate to have leaf miner need to start thinking about what are we gonna do about leaf miners. So, you know, Cindy, over the years, you've grown a few mums. You know, I've talked about some thoughts, but what, what was your experience with, you know, the preventative programs? Well, we like to do a lot of prevent stuff, even in the plug stage, because um, undoubtedly, uh, when we'd go to plant, it was hot and we'd get thunderstorms. So you're putting the, you'd be planting, putting stuff out and it's out there baking and then you'd get a, a storm come through and, and just soak the pot. So they're sitting there and, and you're not able to get much feed on stuff out there. So we like to start with a big beefy liner. We used a 50 cell um, 35 millimeter Ellie to root all our, our mums into. It would give us a bigger root mass and then that would allow us um, to be able to put these pre-treatments on and the larger root mass would allow it to, to take it up better. And it saved a little bit of money treating the liners versus having to treat the whole field and send somebody out with a spray rig and all that. So that was big with us. So having everything well fed when we started. So, you know, if it did get a lot of rain, at least that liner started out in a good space. Uh, we'd put down the fungicide pre-treatments again if you had a lot of rain, that makes sense, help prevent any of those root rots. Uh, we would do a white rust prevent spray prior to the, the liners going out. And we would also, again, review what's out there for insects, what kind of problems are around and, and do any treatments or drenches or whatever's necessary in, in anticipation of those uh, insect problems. Yeah, because that sounds like a great program that helped you get off to a good start so that you weren't all of a sudden going out there two, three weeks later going, hmm, now I got a really big problem because, well, you'd kind of been burnt out by spring and you really hadn't gotten out there and paid a lot of attention. Um, and so now, you got, now, now you're going to be fighting for the next three, four weeks during the heat of the summer, which isn't a good idea. Not fun. So a little bit of, a little bit of prevention goes a long ways, doesn't it? Yeah, for sure. Um, the other thing that we keep running into, um, especially for those growers that are doing a black cloth program, is delay in flowering. We're going to talk more about um, you know, the effects of cold temperatures, but there's also the effect of heat delay when you're pulling black cloth over your mums. Make sure that you, when you're, um, if you're going to be doing a black cloth mum program, that you've gone out and you've sourced your um, plastic that has the white over black um, so that you've got the, the two layer um, plastic so that you can have that white reflecting the heat, especially late in the day when you can um, end up, you know, par roasting, you know, having a little bake oven, um, cooking those plants under a black plastic. But if you use the white over black, that significantly reduces um, the temperature under the black cloth and also then um, gives you less flower delay. So let's talk a little bit about um, some of our other um, challenges. Um, which, of course, the first challenge is, of course, is nutrition. Um, nutrition is all that it is about mums. These are basically plants that thrive with feed. And make sure that you remember that you need to feed before you need. You know, all of us that have got kids, especially teenagers, unfortunately, if they're boys, you know that you basically, you've got this pipsqueak kid that comes down for dinner one night and consumes everything in the entire household. Just suddenly they eat. And they eat and eat. Cindy, did you ever see that with your boys? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then the next morning, this monster comes down because they feed before they need it, because they feed and grow. So when the plants are ready to grow, if they haven't been fed, you're in trouble. So let's take a look at what's important. This is about nitrogen. You know, we all have our bags of fertilizer. We've all seen the bags. We've looked at them and gone, uh-huh. And what does that all mean? Let's just spend a moment. This is a 21,520 fertilizer. It's a fairly low um, nitrogen or not nitrogen, phosphorus feed compared to a 202020. But you know, you've got this ammonical nitrogen and you've got nitrate nitrogen. Well, what does that mean? What does that translate into? So if you've got about um, 
the 7.92% monoclonal nitrogen, 13.08% nitrate nitrogen. Well, you know, what do we have? Well, let's, for um, government work, we're going to say that's 8% um, monoclonal nitrogen, which means that um, about 38% of the total nitrogen that you apply is in the ammonical form. So if you put on 100 parts per million feed, you're going to be putting out 38 parts per million ammonia. If you basically have got um, that 13.08, it's about 13% nitrate um, nitrogen, because notice that 8 plus 13 is 21. That's where they came up with 21. 13%, um, um, that's about 62% of the total nitrogen is in the um, um, nitrate form. So, of course, then you'd end up with about 62 parts per million of the 100 that is nitrate. So you end up with um, <clears throat> about 38% um, 38, uh, 38 um, parts per million of ammonia. And this is a nice ammonia-based feed. So what does that really mean? Well, the fertilizer is formulation is your key to success. Urea and ammonia are critical for branching. They give you big leaves, they give you branching. <clears throat> um, ammonia and urea in and by themselves don't cause stretch. It's when you add phosphorus that you start getting stretch. So if you, um, you know, with this 21520, you don't have um, a lot of phosphorus in there, only 5%. Phosphorus. So basically, you're going to minimize stretch. If you have a 20 20 20, <clears throat> you can end up with the same amount of ammonia, but it's got 20% phosphorus, which means that those plants, because of the, all the phosphorus plus all the ammonia, those are going to stretch. So basically, remember it's the phosphorus plus ammonia that give you the stretch. Nitrate, the absence of ammonia, basically gives you much more compact growth. And this is why it's important to take a look at the fertilizer bag and see what, how much ammonia, how much urea, and how much nitrate is in there. So if we take a look at one of the fertilizers, the 15515, if you notice that you've got about seven parts per million and out of the 100 parts per million, you get about seven parts ammonia, about 14 urea. So you've got a fair chunk about, of um, ammonia and urea in that fertilizer, which um, the rest of it is made up with nitrate, about 78, 79%. This is far superior to if you were to go and have a 13 to 13 plug and bedding plant special. And a lot of different companies manufacture a specific formulation. But notice how different these two um, formulations are. If we take a look at the um, first one, that has zero um, ammonia. And it has 6.9, about 7 um, parts per million from urea. And the rest of it is nitrate. So this is a pretty heavy duty nitrate feed program, which of course we know will be more compact. Look at the other um, formulation, the second one. It has ammonia, which is a much faster response than urea. Um, and it has no urea. So these are subtle differences, can give you a dramatic difference in the plant performance. So these are both very important to have um, and to look at when you um, look at your program. So Cindy, if you were gonna be putting together your fertilizer program, which one would you use and when? So the ammonia and urea we would use to start and adding in that phosphorus is pretty good too to, to get that initial growth and stretch on the plants. And then when you were more where you wanted to be, we would use the, the nitrate to, to tone and keep the plants from getting too large. Yeah, and that's and the right soft. strategy because that worked well, right? Yeah, it did. Yeah, it got you a big plant, got you well toned at the end. Now, one of the key things that growers are um, forgetting about is the micronutrients. Notice that that second 13213 had no minor nutrients. That meant that it has no phosphorus, I'm sorry, no night, um, iron, no manganese, no zinc, no copper, no boron, you're going to be in trouble. Micronutrients are key to plant health, um, just as micronutrients are required for human health. So, and you don't need a lot, but you got to have them. And so make sure that your fertilizer is supplying sufficient micronutrients to ensure good, strong growth. A lot of growers don't have the ability or the interest um, to use liquid fertilizer so that they go and use a CRF, controlled release for, um, fertilizer. 
So um, I know, Cindy, you deal with a lot of growers around the country. I think you may have used it sometime in um, your um, experience. So when, what ones did you use and when did you need to get the release? Because you want to have controlled release. So what was your um, experience with controlled release fertilizers? Well, we had some good, some bad. Um, so, and we've actually seen people switching from one to the other based on some of the experiences they had. So with the Osmocote, because it can be temperature sensitive, uh, if we started out with a cool season, uh, then the mums weren't getting the, the product that they needed. They weren't getting the feed and you needed to supplement with some liquid feed. And we've also seen where you had a hot season, there wasn't a lot of rain, and actually too much was released and you could end up with some salt problems. So uh, in my area, at least, we had seen a lot of the growers uh, turning to the Nutricoat, um, which again, as you note there, has it, some of its own issues. If it's too wet, then you don't see the release. So you have to juggle a little bit. Um, and pay attention and like you said, do your testing and see where your EC is and make sure that you're not getting any problems based on the weather when you are using the controlled release. Yeah, because this is um, probably, it's a very successful, very useful tool when used correctly, but you gotta monitor it. You, gotta, you can't just throw it out there and hope it works. You've gotta make sure that you get out there and um, be monitoring the EC to make sure that it's releasing sufficiently early or you're gonna end up with runty look little mums that you're gonna to have to push really hard to get size, you're gonna to have to push really hard to get any kind of growth on them. Um, but then you also have to watch them so that you're sure that if they're releasing too fast that you can get the water on so that you don't end up with high salt. So you really need to just monitor them, but they're a very useful tool if used correctly. So let's take a look about some of the other problems that we would have at this time of the year and then again, we see the same problems again at the end of the season. Remember a key factor could be considered a feature with no benefits um, of chrysanthemum, especially garden mumps. Remember that they're thermophotoperiodic. Remember Bill, when I had you practice that term when we did the podcast? <laughs> Uh, I did. I had to say it over and over and over and then ask you probably five times what it meant. But absolutely, yeah. it definitely seems critical to the whole process about how these plants grow. Yeah, because if, it's, if you remember that low temperature is actually a stronger inducer um, than photoperiod when it comes to flowering. So if you had a very long day, so you had a 16-hour day, but the night temperatures were 50 degrees, those plants would flower. If you had a plant, if you had a 12 hour photo period, but you had night temperatures 75, 78 degrees night after night, those would be very vegetative just because temperatures so dramatically, especially on the extremes of very hot and very cold, will dramatically influence whether the plants are induced or they're not induced into flowering. So, you know, it's kind of a rule of thumb. Um, you know, if your night temperatures, and it's all about the night temperatures, um, are greater than 70 degrees, and the higher it is, the more, the stronger the signal to be strong vegetative growth. And so that's why we always watch what is the temperatures from about July 20th to oh, about August 1st. That window is really critical because the photo period is getting to be right for induction. But if you have high night temperatures, you're gonna have monster mums. They're gonna be big because they're gonna be vegetative and they're gonna be delayed because you didn't induce them. If you have kind of right around 70, a little less than 70 degrees night temperatures, um, then basically you increase the chance for flowering and photo period is in critical for induction. So if you've got you know, moderate temperatures like Cindy had up in um, Massachusetts, but the days are long, which they are up in Massachusetts during you know, June and July and going into um, early August, the days were long enough that as long as the temperatures weren't cold, plants stayed vegetative. And they, um, then as the days got shorter, bam, they induced and off you went to flowering. Then you have those people in Colorado, high mountain areas up in the tundra of Minnesota, where um, you end up with low night temperatures and suddenly, um, especially in the July and early August, it would get very cold for a couple nights after what we used to call sweltering July heat. People in the South laughed at that. Um, 
and basically what happened is you had flower induction and runt mums. You know, back in the Minnesota days with those old growers who knew the Min series, you know, they'd plant these miserable looking little cuttings out there in late June when the frost was, finally was gone. About July 4th, it got hot for three days, and those mums exploded into this huge bushel basket sized plants. And then, of course, it got cold and they all induced, and they were great. Um, so that's where we really understood this whole thermal photoperiodic induction. Now, one of the keys is to watch the hours of night temperature below 70 degrees, because that can kind of help guide you as to are you going to end up with monster mums or runt mums. So if you have one night at, you know, where the night, you know, for about five hours, it's less than 70 degrees, probably not going to make a big difference. But now if you start having four nights and it's for a longer period of time where it's less um, 70, well, now you're going to have potential, especially a photo period is coming into play. If you have six or seven nights um, where it's, you know, at four for four hours or more where you have less than 70, now you're going to start picking up a strong induction signal. So you really have to kind of watch, you know, when, how many nights it is and how many consecutive nights that you have. This is why sometimes it's a little confusing and why we say stay focused in that um, late June period to help you understand are you going to have big mums or little mums. Where it's really important is going back to remember that white plastic and black plastic thing is remember what is the black, the black cloth temperatures underneath that black cloth. Because if your night temperatures underneath that black cloth are running well over 70 degrees, well, your mums are going to be delayed. They're not going to induce because they're basically, that's a non-inductive photo period, even though you've got a short days. So that's why we want to use that white plastic over black to help cool those temperatures down so that you can get good induction. That's why a lot of times when you see growers that are actually putting the plastic directly down on the crop, it's really important to use some of that white over black. If you have a big greenhouse and you got temperature cooling, eh, probably not such a big deal. So um, have you seen that, Cindy, where people are um, running into these kind of problems? Yeah, with the, the heat delay from the black cloth for sure, because sometimes they're putting it right over the top of the plants almost and it gets pretty hot under there and then they're not flowering when they want them to be. Yeah, so if you've had problems in the past, this would probably be something you want to consider. The other strategy, and um, Cindy touched on this, is the use of florel for um, flower abortion and branching. You know, do you have some experience with that, Cindy? Yeah, the florel we used to use in both our liner stage and um, in the field. And again, um, part of that was due to the temperatures we have up here. But um, in the liner stage, it would be just another thing in our arsenal to try to prevent any um, flower bud formation because uh, we don't want to get those crown buds going and then uh, once we're out in the field you know we could often get a little bit of cool temperatures um, so we like to put some florel down uh, just to again try to abort any uh, bud formation and to eliminate uh, crown budding because we all don't want to see that we just want to have a nice mum crop yeah and, you know, a couple of just top line um, things to think about with Florel is, you know, this is a um, stress enhanced response, which that means that if you've got the plants too dry, if you've got the plants on high salts, if they're starving to death, um, and then you put Florel on it, you really enhance the, the response to Florel. So you have the, oops, oh, yeah. what's that? <laughs> um, because the stress enhances it. So make sure that the plants are not stressed or growing well um, when you put it on. And also, this is a really quirky chemical that we use. We don't really, it's not as important with other chemicals we mix, although chemical mixing is always important, um, but with chlorel, ethyl, it's really important to follow the mixing directions because it has some unique characteristics that can spell the difference between success and failure. So I think, Bill, I, we've written up um, a fairly long white paper on some of the ins and the outs that people have had. So where can they find that? So, uh, yes, we've got the Florel Ethyl white paper. Um, it's, it's very new. Uh, we've got it available at the ballseed.com garden mums page, or at least it will be available any minute now, certainly by the time folks listen to this. And uh, we've also posted it to the, our Ball Seed LinkedIn page, as well as the Greenhouse Tech Team, which is 
uh, a new closed Facebook group. It's moderated by Ball. There's hundreds and hundreds, probably uh, be a thousand by the time uh, you see this recording, uh, growers on the tech team and they're sharing information. And right now, starting to talk garden mums. So you're gonna see many garden mum topics during the season. There's an ask the expert feature where you can just post a question, post a picture, and you're gonna get an answer very quickly from either someone on the ball mums tech team or other growers that have also seen a, a similar challenge. So very easy to, to get into the greenhouse tech team. If you're listening to this, if you've made it all the way to this point, you are a grower and you will have no problem answering the qualifying questions and joining the community. So all you need to do is search greenhouse tech team in the Facebook search box and uh, you'll see it pop up as an, as a group option. So uh, yeah, Will, thanks for queuing that up. I think that the Greenhouse Tech Team is an excellent resource for growers who have a, a quick question to ask and want to get uh, answers from either technical experts or their peers. Both uh, Will and Cindy are in the Greenhouse Tech Team, so you might just hear back from them real quick. And I do also want to give a shout out to the entire Ball Mums team. Um, there's a whole team of resources at, at, within Ball Seed that uh, know a lot about garden mums, as I'm sure you've heard in this webinar and you're gonna see uh, in action, be sure you can check with your ball seed sales rep. Um, most of them have a lot of garden mum experience. Call color link, call into customer service and you're going to get uh, quick answers on garden mums and be sure to use the resources that we highlighted earlier in this presentation. So I really appreciate it you guys. You've given us some fantastic resources, good advice extreme positivity kicking off the uh, garden mum season across North America. You know, I just want to give everyone listening uh, uh, a shout out for uh, uh, going, going forward with this great seasonal crop. I think that nobody, uh, uh, nothing's more beautiful than walking into a garden center in the fall and seeing beautiful blooming garden mums. Uh, it just makes everybody feel uh, excited for the season. So I'm Bill Calkins. I want to thank Cindy and Will for uh, your time today and wish everybody the best this year. Um, well, thanks a lot, Bill. It's just been a lot of fun. And I hope uh, people have any questions, by all means, get, jump on the Greenhouse Tech Team Facebook page. It's probably the fastest um, way to get your questions answered um, that's out there. So I encourage everyone to uh, sign up and um, see, ask their questions, see what's going on, get some information. And um, if you have any questions, by all means, shoot us our way and we'll get them um, put together as quickly as possible. And on behalf of the whole uh, Ball Mom team, I'd like to thank you both for putting this together and, and getting info out to the growers to help everybody get off to a good start. And hopefully they won't need to use our tech team too much other than to post pretty pictures of nice growing mums, but, but we're there if you need us. Awesome, hey, thank, thank you guys. You.